thank you, John, for that intro. Um, as he said, my name is Mark Dalgleish from here in Melbourne. Um, I'd first like to clear up, I actually didn't found, Mel, uh, found Melb.js. That actually, the credit for that goes to um, Tammy Buto and Annette Burgo. So big thanks to them for that. Uh, I'm merely carrying the torch in that regard. So as you may know, I'm here to talk about taking JavaScript out of context. What does that mean? Well, basically, I'm talking to you about this, one of the scarier parts of JavaScript. Because I'm sure we've all written code that looks something like this. We've got a, a classic click handler, and inside of it, we're referring to this. Now, this here refers to the element that triggered this handler. And inside of this handler, we might want to do something asynchronous, like we've got a set timeout here where we want to, one second later, update the content of this element. Except that second uh, reference to inner HTML doesn't seem to work. The, uh, the text doesn't update. And your reaction might be something like, what? Like, what happened? I, this was one thing, and now it's something else for no apparent reason. I didn't change it. It's very strange. Next, you might, uh, you might have an object that has a method on it. Say hi. You might have looked this up dynamically. You're going to save a reference to this method in a local variable. And so now you call this method via this variable we've set up. And instead of saying, hi, my name is Mark, we get, hi, my name is undefined. And your, your reaction to this is like, Really, JavaScript? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Um, an error would have been nicer, maybe, I don't, I don't know. And finally, you might do something like this, where we, you've got a method already, already to go. You don't need to set up an anonymous click handling function, so you just pass it in, right? And you click the element, and once again, we see the same kind of behavior happening, where uh, the value is not coming out correctly, it doesn't, doesn't seem to work. And this is the point where people probably lose it with JavaScript. They flock to Twitter and vent. And, and you know what? I, I don't think that's a completely irrational response, because what's happening here doesn't really help us form a clear mental model of what's happening mechanically here. Um, so what I'd like to do first is, is fix this and make sure we're all on the same page as to how context is resolved in JavaScript. So the very short version, enough to get you out of hot water, is to first understand that every function in JavaScript shadows the value of this. So whenever you see a new function, it's got its own this that's going to clobber the, the one in the outer context. So a, a, a recipe for you to figure out what the value of this is in any given function is to look at when the function is called. Because when that happens, I want you to look to the left of the dot. So here's a very simple example where we call person.sayHi. Person is to the left of the dot, so person is the value of this. It's really that straightforward. Um, if it's just a plain function call, even if it's a reference to what you think is a method, there's nothing to the left of the dot when we call it, so this defaults to the global object being window or undefined in strict mode. And also we have constructors where we invoke a function with new, and in that case we get a new instance, and this refers to that new instance. So that's enough to kind of figure out what the value of this is, but what, what we haven't done is figured out what's actually going on, and, and more importantly, why. So let's dig into that a little further. Now, um, Ben sort of did it subliminally, I guess, for me already, but I'd like to implant in your mind the image of Schrodinger's cat the classic thought experiment from quantum mechanics, this idea where we have a cat in a box that's both alive and dead, and it's only when we open the box that it takes the form of one of these two potential outcomes. Um, in this case, unfortunately, the cat is alive. Um, so that may seem a bit strange. Keep that in the back of your mind. It'll make sense soon. So the first question I have for you is in JavaScript, how do we define constructors? And the answer is, of course, with functions, because we don't really have a constructor type that's separate from functions. Here's a person class that's a constructor. And um, it's really just a plain function, if you look at it. And so much so that we have to uppercase the first letter purely out of convention so that other developers have a heads up that this is a constructor, so that they invoke it the correct way. How do you define methods in JavaScript? Um, the answer to that, of course, is once again with functions. We don't really have a special method type that's separate from functions. Ultimately, a method is just a function that happens to be on an object. In this case, we have a person object we've defined on the fly, and it has a say hi method, but look at it again, it's really just a function. So if, if everything is implemented as a function in JavaScript, you've really got to ask yourself, 
you know, what, what happens if we start to be a bit more devious here and do some unexpected things? Um, here's, a, here's a very simple example where we define a say hi function, just a plain function. And then we have a, a person object with a say hi property that points to this, this function. So now it's kind of like it's a method as well. So we can call this function directly and treat it like a function. We can invoke it with new and it's going to act like a constructor. Or we can access it via the person object and it's going to act like a method and, and um, it's, it, it's different in every case. So if we, if we think about context in all three of these things, you've got window, you've got the new instance, you've got person, um, and it all depends on how we called it. So we have the same function in memory, just one function, but it's being called in three completely different ways and the context is shifting constantly. Um, Axel Rushmeyer, who spoke at Web Direction South last year, he, um, he described the problem as being that current uh, functions are playing triple duty. And I think that's actually key to why context is so difficult to, to wrestle with in JavaScript. Because often we get our wires crossed and we want it to act like a method, but actually we call it like a function. Because if you look at a function and you ask yourself, is this a constructor, is this a method, or is this a plain old function? Uh, while you may think it's one of these three things and it, and it would have been written in such a way, ultimately it's the calling code that decides which one of these three things it's going to act like. So I'd like to think of it like in JavaScript we have these Schrodinger's functions, where when you define a function it's at once equally a constructor, a method, and a plain old function. It's only when we open the box, the act of calling the function, that we actually uh, decide which one of these three things it's going to act like. Where this gets especially tricky and often bites us, as we've seen earlier, is when you're passing a callback to someone else. Because what you've got to remember when you're passing functions around is that you're not the calling code. You're just handing a reference over to someone else and they're going to run it. So what does that mean? Um, let's look at a very, very simple example. This is run as callback function and all it does is take a function in and run it. Now if we think about our look to the left of the dot rule that we talked about earlier, there's no dot here. There's no uh, implied context, so what happens is this will run in the context of window. Where this trips us up is we may think we're passing in a method. So to you, it's very clearly a method on the, the person object, but once it crosses that boundary, um, the context is lost, and that's where you'll get hi, my name is undefined, because it's looking for a property on window, which is not at all what you might have expected. So can we explicitly set this? Can we get some control back in this highly dynamic environment? And um, luckily we can. So in JavaScript, when we're calling a function, um, functions are objects and they have methods, so we can use the call and apply method that exists on all functions. And basically what this allows us to do with the first argument uh, is to specify the, the context explicitly rather than letting it get figured out uh, dynamically. When you're passing a method uh, around as a callback, um, what we want to do is we want to lock in the context and say, here's the method, but whenever you invoke this, we definitely want the value of this to be person, because if it's not, bad things are going to happen, as we've seen. So this is a very simple way, using the bind method on every function to, to set in stone forever for this function the value of this. And when you're trying to maintain the context uh, when you're nesting functions, as we've seen in our click handler example from earlier, um, bind comes in handy again, because what we can do is we can bind this into the new function. So what that does is it says, whatever the outer context is, if it's a DOM element, we want that to carry on through. Um, don't bother creating a new value of this being window. That's completely useless to me. So we can see that um, even when you get your head around it, it's, it's, it's quite tricky. You know, is, is this worth it? Because even for seasoned JavaScript veterans, it can be a bit like this. You're, you know, you're, you're wielding context really well, and then you smack yourself in the face once again. Because it's, it's really, it, it can be a challenge to kind of keep track of it. So what I want to talk about uh, for you, uh, with, with you briefly is another option that I, I really like, which is to only use functions as functions. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, here's a very simple example of something that's kind of doing the job of a constructor. This is a make person function, and whenever you call it, out comes a new person object. But that object is kind of defined on the fly. It's just an object literal at the bottom there, and it has a say hi property that points to a say hi function that we've uh, defined in this function here. <laughs> 
Uh, one thing you notice here too is na name is now effectively a, a private property that's hidden away in a closure. Where I've used this in my personal work is in Bespoke JS, the presentation framework that's driving the slides you're looking at now. And whenever you instantiate a new presentation, you call the bespoke.from method, and it sets up a bunch of variables internal to this function. And we've got um, something that stores the event handler um, callbacks, and we've got some next and previous, and so on. And then we've got um, out, out the uh, end of this function comes an object with references to all the things that we want to expose as the, the public API to this deck instance. And what's really great about this pattern is because we're harnessing closures, if you need private state, um, something that can, is basically next to impossible when you're working with complex prototypal inheritance, here it's very simple because if you want to maintain private state, you simply don't expose it. If it's not attached to that object that gets returned, it might as well be a private variable. So what we have here is a pattern that has no methods in the traditional sense and no constructors. What we have is just plain functions that return objects. But those objects are powered by closures, which to me are possibly the best thing about JavaScript. So I was lucky enough to see Douglas Crockford talk at Yao last year, um, and he briefly mentioned this exact pattern. And about it, he said that this is everything you need to make objects, and it all works because of functions. If inside of this function you, you want to have some inheritance, um, you can just use object.create. You can just use all the tools that you normally would. Um, and and it, he argues that it leads to much more straightforward code and actually more powerful code. So in honor of Douglas Crockford, I'd like to refer to this pattern as functions the good parts, because like a lot of things in his seminal book, it's, it's really an act of willfully, knowingly ignoring two-thirds of what we can do with functions, but doing so in a way that leads to easier to reason about code, less error-prone code, and actually more powerful code thanks to closures. And moving forward, what's really great is ES6 is going to make this pattern really easy. Why? Because we have arrow functions at our, at our disposal. What I really like about arrow functions is, by their very nature, they can't actually be used as constructors or methods. They're really just plain old functions, and they even um, don't shadow this. They basically bind to this and carry on uh, the outer context um, inside. So if we look at our make person example from earlier, because we didn't use um, context in any way, you didn't see this anywhere in that code, we can basically go ahead and replace all our functions with arrow functions, and, um, and the code will work great. Um, plus, I'm using let and template strings. That's pretty cool. And if we look back again to our very first code example of the click handler with a set timeout nested inside, this is actually a really good example of how classic functions we have today can, can happily coexist with arrow functions, and they each have their place. Because inside our click handler, we actually do want to have a dynamic value of this. Because we, when we define this function, we don't know ahead of time what the element's going to be. So being dynamic here makes sense. But once we set up this callback, we definitely don't want to shadow the value of this to be something else. We want to make sure that that context is carried through to our callback. So ultimately, the, the message I want to leave you with is that in your own code, you don't need to use this. Um, there are other patterns that sometimes will, will fit the bill better. Of course, there are going to be times where you have no choice but to use this, um, like we saw in Ryan's talk yesterday about web components that makes heavy use of prototypal inheritance. But so in those cases especially, you really do still need to understand context. So hopefully, if it's something that you've struggled with in the past, um, this talk has served as a nice primer and give you a, a bit of an idea of what's happening under the hood with, with um, context. And if you only remember one thing from my talk, if there's one takeaway that you're going to take back um, into your work, it's to uh, beware of Schrodinger's functions and to always look to the left of the dot. Um, that's it for me. Slides are up at bit.ly slash get in context. Thanks for listening.